Okay, everybody, this is um, our first Living with Wildlife seminar. Um, so I'd like to welcome you all here to our Living with Wildlife class. So I recognize most of you as students, but we also have some guests here um, from across the university community. So we're very happy to share our class time here with you for this, uh, our first of our seminar speakers. Um, today we're welcoming Kat Techman uh, here to speak to us about integrating culture and science. Kat is a um, UW Extension Environmental Outreach State Specialist. I'll let her tell you what that means. I actually had to write down all the words so that I didn't miss any part of her title so that I get her job description correct. Um, so I first met Kat as part of a class that she and I are fortunate enough to teach together. That's a field-based class up in Ashland. Um, about climate change and it's looking at, um, part of it is looking at the cultural impacts of climate change and trying to make climate change real to people. So Kat's gonna share a little bit about that with you guys here today, but um, part of why I wanted her to come speak to us in particular is because we're talking about in this class right now, um, wildlife as culture. And I think sometimes it's hard for us as scientists to be able to understand the role that culture plays in terms of science and our scientific background. Um, so one of my favorite stories that Kat tells, um, or that she would tell me when, when I was up in Ashland with her, relates to her trying to, to connect to scientists at, uh, at Glyphwick, um, trying to get scientists up there to understand um, the importance of culture as well and and working with them on events uh, and trying to get them to do things like arts and crafts at their recharge event. And I think that this is just a really neat idea. So um, I'll turn it over to you, Kat. Do you mind first just explaining a little bit about what a UW Extension Environmental Outreach State Specialist does um, for us? And then I'll let you go ahead and get started. Well, bonjour everyone. Hello. Um, thank you for the kind introduction and thank you everyone for joining me on such a nice afternoon and taking the time um, to hear what I have to share. Um, I, my title is Environmental Outreach State Specialist. It's a lot of, it's a mouthful. Uh, basically, I work on environmental interpretation and education outreach in a number of different venues, everything from designing uh, exhibits to videos to websites to in-person teaching to field courses, as Dr. Sartini said. Um, just the whole range and gamut of um, ways to make environmental issues come alive to people. And I work a lot with, uh, my presentation will probably explain quite a bit of my current work, which is with the tribes and tribal nations in terms of the integration of traditional ecological knowledge and what we might call Western science or scientific ecological knowledge to make climate change come alive to people of all cultures so that they take action to either mitigate or adapt to climate change. But we'll cover more of that. So. It's a kind of a jack of all trades, maybe master of none type position, but allows me to work on a number of really cool projects throughout the mostly Lake Superior region, but also statewide. Very good, thank you. All right, so what we'll do is let, um, is hold questions until the end. So if you have something that pops up that you'd like to know about as we're moving through, type it in the chat box. And then once, uh, once we're done with the PowerPoint, then um, we'll address those questions and make sure that um, we can really get to talk about some of the things that come up, um, come up as part of the presentation today. All right. Okay. All right. Okay, ready? Whoops, I think we're ready to go. So I've been asked to um, share weaving culture and science together, how we can make our connections stronger. So my name, uh, my uh, position at the university, many of the resources that I'm going to cite, I've uh, put links to them uh, under the resource, so you'll be able to go back and take a look at some of these things like to drill down a little bit more and understand a little bit more about them. So I want to first of all acknowledge the location that I'm in. Um, what is being, I'm going to share with you comes from the heart, not only my heart, but the heart of the Lake Superior uh, Chippewa or Ojibwe Indian country. This includes the ceded territory of northern Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Michigan. 
and the 11 Ojibwe tribes that are living in that area, and also folks that are living in urban areas that belong to those communities. Um, these examples were developed with tribal partners and non-tribal partners uh, in the Shawanigan Bay Ashland area, but they're really applicable to all cultures and locations, and I hope to demonstrate that um, today. Um, I do want to say with all humbleness that my journey and what I'm going to share with you has been made possible by very generous and kind people who have guided me, including these project partners. And you see the National Park Service and the U.S. Forest Service, um, my organization, UW Extension, but in particular, the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, representing off-reservation treaty rights of the 11 Ojibwe tribes that I mentioned, and two tribal nations that are in the Ashland area, the Bad River Band and the Red Cliff Band of the Lake Superior Ojibwe. So to them, I would like to say chimigwich, which is a big thanks. All right, what I hope to share with you today, uh, a couple of things, this is kind of our outline. What is culture? So I thought that might be a good place to start because we all have different definitions of culture. Uh, whose science are we talking about when we talk about integrating culture and science? Why use traditional ecological knowledge when we're weaving together different ways of knowing? And then some examples of weaving together different knowledges and I'll share a couple of those with you. And then some thoughts, some personal thoughts about culture and, and traditional knowledge and weaving them together. So, um, what is culture? So I'm just gonna kind of let you mull that in your mind. What, how would you define culture? There's a little graphic on the right side there that indicates some of the elements of culture. Um, but if we do some searches on what is culture, um, we see if we do Google searches, Webster, Webster search, Wikipedia search, what we see that's very common to all of them is the indication of human, human intellectual, human knowledge, human and individuals, very human centric way of defining culture. Nothing wrong with that, but that's very Western in terms of how we would look at culture. If we would take a look at the definition of culture from the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission's tribal adaptation menu, we see a little bit different way of defining it based on relationships between the environment and its beings, not just human beings, but all beings. So with that kind of perspective, that culture may be defined in different ways and might be broader than what we normally think of in our Western perspective. Let's talk a little bit about science. We can kind of talk about how we can blend these two together. So when we talk about science, most of us think about what we call scientific ecological knowledge or SEK, and I'm gonna to refer to it as SEK. Often it's called Western science, which is really a terrible term, academic science, or sometimes just science, which is pretty presumptuous because there's other ways of knowing that I'm gonna demonstrate. It's based on measurements and modeling. Oftentimes it's, it's provided to us in the tech transfer way of communicating that provides data data bursts or charts or lots of information, but it often doesn't resonate with many people. Here's another science or way of knowing. Local place-based uh, ecological knowledge, either place-based or local ecological knowledge. This is based on observations locally, local cultural knowledge, but we need to use some caution when we use this way of knowing because short-term observations may not be as reliable uh, as indicators of change as longer-term observations. And finally, the other knowledge we're going to talk about weaving together today is traditional ecological knowledge, or TEK. It's some, it has, goes by different names, tribal ecological knowledge, indigenous knowledge, indigenous science, also two-eyed thinking, which is an interesting term used by the Mi'kmaq people, indicating that one eye would be looking with Western science, or SEK, and the other with TEK, two-eyed thinking. Based on generations old experience with the environment and beings, and if we hearken back to that definition of culture that Griffith provided, we see here that relationship piece. And it provides more reliable place-based evidence than some of our local ecological knowledge. Why is that? Hmm? Because it's over such a long term. It also can be ensconced in the language as well. So we take a look at TEK. Um, observations tend to be from a single locale or a very long period of time. They are qualitative. They tend to be from resource users themselves who harvesting success is dependent on the quality and reliability of their ecological observations, or they have difficulties in providing for themselves and their families. So long-term knowledge. Whereas our scientific observations tend to be quantitative, usually made by a small group of professionals, 
might be at one point of time or many points of time, but not necessarily over that long period. Could be from a wide range of sites though, but lacks that a long-term perspective of TEK. If you'd like to drill down for more information about this, the re resource on the bottom of the page, Robin Kimmerer, who is a Potawatomi woman and also a PhD botanist at SUNY University at, at New York State, is one of the premier authors and uh, researchers about integrating TEK and SEK. This is one of her uh, articles. It's a short article. It's a good read. But she also has YouTube presentations and a book called Braiding Sweetgrass that I would highly recommend. Okay, so why let me get this out of the way here. Um, why integrate TEK? Well, I think I've given you some of the clues already. For generations, indigenous people have been relying on the sustainability of plant and animal species to support cultural practices and life ways, um, spiritual life ways, subsistence. And because TEK is based on long-term continued relationship with the environment, it can help us evaluate changes that we are observing and in inform our responses. And the example I'm going to provide to you is wild rice harvesting. This is an early picture of wild rice harvesting circa about the turn of the century and wild rice harvesting today. It's done pretty much in the same way. The jima on the canoe might be a little bit different, not birch bark anymore, but the same type of practice is used here. So we have long-term evidence then and knowledge within the culture here of changes that might be observed in the harvest today and both in the bean of wild rice, that species, and the habitats that support it. That can give us long-term evidence of change, such as climate change. So let's take a look at climate change for one example. So here, indigenous knowledge of natural systems and languages, such as when the month of wild rice harvesting occurs, which is somewhat not syncing up with uh, when wild rice is being harvested anymore, that can provide some pretty long-term place-based indicators of change beyond weather variability. TEK can provide us that baseline for evaluating place-based evidence of change that we're observing in our communities. Let me give you an example of why we need to use caution with place-based or local ecological knowledge. This is research, you can see the citation at the bottom of the slide here. This is research that came out of Canada where a local um, Anglo community was certain that the huge windstorms that they were seeing in other pretty violent weather was due to climate change. And it actually was due to weather variability. This community did not have long-term enough place-based evidence in order to really evaluate whether it was climate change over a long period of time or simply weather variability. So this is where TEK can really help us provide a baseline for that evaluation. All right, so why should we integrate multiple ways of knowing? How could that benefit us in terms of knowing and communicating about issues, environmental issues, or taking action on them. There's a number of reasons. I'm just gonna pop through these pretty quickly. Increase ability to relate to others, gain new perspectives, foster inclusiveness, develop deeper, more, more holistic understanding of issues, consider different options for action, respect uh, locally based and locally sourced knowledge that's generations old, build relationships, and also to decolonize our perspectives and our ways of working with others. And these are just a few. There's many others I'm sure that you can think of to add to my, my little diagram here. So how can we weave culture and science together? So this is the nitty gritty. We've got culture, we've got science, we have different knowledges. How do we weave these two together? So instead of the uh, uh, scientific ecological knowledge, which is the translations of facts and tech transfer, and I'm just gonna excuse myself for one minute. I think I did turn my phone off. Instead of, instead of scientific ecological knowledge, the tech transfer we were talking about before, we're going to talk about revelations of relationships, connections for actions. So how do we braid them together? We're going to use what's called an interpretive framework. Now, some of you may be taking uh, interpretive design class at UW Stevens Point, so this may be familiar to you. Others, this might be a new communication or frame, framing tool. We're going to start with culture, and we're going to relate what we're speaking about to a person's experience and their culture. And we have a number of different ways of defining culture, basically to what people value. Otherwise, what we're speaking of will not stick. This can be a cultural practice, a recreation activity, an economic activity, it may be a being that they enjoy seeing. Um, we'll give examples of how this works. 
We want to reveal multiple ways of knowing, not just tech transfer. We want to weave in traditional ecological knowledge, place-based knowledge, um, and also scientific ecological knowledge when all are available. And there we had, the, uh, I just did that little switch there between the two, uh, looking at uh, charts of climate change versus place-based evidence of change based on what's being observed. In this case, maple syrup. We want to present these perspectives as a whole story, not just separate disjointed parts. Uh, we just don't want to lay culture and science on top of each other or just look at them separately. We want to weave these together, as Robin Kiminer talks about, to create a stronger, more culturally rel relevant knowledge base. Um, so we're going to talk about how we can do this from a number of different examples. And the final thing about an interpretive communication framework is we want to provoke culturally relevant action. This is the big so what. We want to increase awareness, but we want people to do something with the knowledge that they're gaining. And uh, what I would refer to here is, is Freeman Tilden's Principles of Interpretation, a citation at the bottom of the screen. This is an old book, but it's a classic. Um, that is used as kind of the guidebook for the interpretive uh, communication method. All right, so if we put this all together, and um, Katie, I'm just going to interrupt you for a second. I'm seeing, seeing a concerned citizen trying to be admitted to the room. Is that something that I should take action on? Okay, all righty. Um, so if we take a look at this model as, as a whole, we can see relate, reveal, tell the whole, and provoke. So what are sources of traditional ecological knowledge that we can use? Well, one of the very good one that we're very lucky to have now is the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission is, uh, has published research based on interviews with knowledge keepers, elders, and language holders called the Climate Change Vulnerability Assessment. And I'm going to demonstrate the use of this in weaving TEK, place-based knowledge, and SEK knowledge. So, over 60 species or beans have been evaluated um, in this assessment in terms of their vulnerability to climate change based on TEK. So we've got some good evidence and good research now available. Let me start with some examples of how to weave these knowledges together. So I'm gonna start with uh, the Ginkinu Wizziwe Anji Waban or Guiding for Tomorrow Climate Change Model. We call this GWAL for short because it's a lot easier to say GWAL, so GWAL word is pretty long. Um, the goal of the GWAL project is to create a culturally relevant model that builds awareness of climate change to provoke action. So you can see those interpretive pieces right in the bold statement. Here's how it works. So it weaves together TEK and SEK in kind of a novel way, I think, using an interpretive framework by revealing how climate change is affecting the sustainability of beings and habitats that they rely on that support cultural and economic practices we value, and something that will stick with us, by integrating these different ways of knowing, different evidences to provoke action. So we can give the example that fly fishing uh, relies on the sustainability of brook trout, a species that requires cold water habitats. So the key here is the sustainability of species and beings and the habitats that they rely on. This relationship, again, we go back to the word relationship that we saw in the definition of culture between the sustainability of beings and the environment is how we weave these knowledges together. And I'll demonstrate how this works. So here's an example. The example is wild rice or manuman harvesting. Manuman is the Ojibwe word for the good berry. So this activity is very culturally relevant. It's a spiritual activity. It's very important to the Ojibwe people and to many of us. So this activity relies on the sustainability of what being, of course, wild rice, which requires shallow water uh, habitats with moderate water level changes uh, and cool growing season conditions. If we take a look at um, place-based TEK and SEK evidence of what might be happening to uh, Manuman, we see increased flooding of wild rice on the Bad River Reservation and the Bad River Cagan Sloughs and also through many of our uh, coastal wild rice beds and interrupted harvest of wild rice um, for the last 10 or 15 years. That is unprecedented in tribal, in tribal knowledge, in TEK. If we take a look at um, the, SE, the TEK evidence here um, from the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, we see that Manuman as a being is highly vulnerable to climate change. Again, Katie, I'm gonna ask the question, can you see around my, I'm gonna 
can, I, there, I've got you out of the, there we go. I've got you out of the slide there a little bit better. Okay, so you can see that the Newman is highly vulnerable to climate change based on TEK. And if we look at, and if we look at, I'm moving you around here so that we can see a little bit better. If we look at um, SEK evidence of climate change, we see projected changes in precipitation events of two inches or more that could wash away Newman. Uh, remember, it needs moderate level water fluctuations. We see an increase of that by mid-century, uh, maybe three and a half times more, which means that there will be more flooding of wild rice. So in this case, we can ask, do culture and science agree that climate change impacts the sustainability of wild rice? What do you think? And what does this mean for cultural practices that rely on Manuman? They are being threatened by climate change. Let's take a look at another one. And I'm going to have to move you around here. Um, here's an activity. And I selected a couple different activities to give you kind of a variety of ways that this model can be applied so you get a feel for it. This activity is deer hunting, which is coming up pretty soon here in Wisconsin. The being that it relies on is Wawashikeshi, uh, the white-tailed deer, a highly adaptable being to a wide variety of habitats. And it certainly benefits from warmer winters that reduce energy loss and stress. So what evidence are we seeing of change here? Well, we're seeing place-based evidence of increased population in Wisconsin's deer herd. If we take a look at uh, the Glyphwick vulnerability assessment, we see that Wawashkeshi here is less vulnerable to climate change based on TEK from elders, language keepers, and knowledge holders. We take a look at what SEK science is saying may be happening with our winter temperatures, which is one graph or chart map that I selected here. We see a decrease in frequency of nights below zero, in fact, a warming of winter time, which is going to be very favorable to Wawashkeshi. What does this mean for the sustainability of this being and this activity? This is a being that may be favored by climate change, but could there be other limiting factors that may affect it as the climate warms, including CWD and possibly tick-borne issues? Here's an example that takes humans, us, out of the picture and just looks at one being, Waboos or the snowshoe hare. So Waboos, little Waboos requires snowy habitat for winter camouflage. If we take a look at evidence of change, we see poor little Waboos here in the upper right-hand corner with no snow on the ground because winters are warming. So we have a phenology mismatch, making him very vulnerable to predation. If we take a look what knowledge keepers are suggesting uh, maybe the vulnerability of Waboos, he is the most vulnerable of the selected species in their chart. Extremely vulnerable to a changing climate because he relies on snowy winters for habitat. And as winters are warming, as indicated by SEK, this chart predicting or projecting changes in Wisconsin's winter temperatures, warming almost nine degrees in northern Wisconsin or more, that's going to mean more rain and ice than snow. What will happen to poor little Waboos in terms of sustainability of this species? Maybe we don't care very much about Waboos, but are there other uh, economic or cultural practices that rely on cold and snow that, uh, that are of value to us? Here's one. So here's, a, here's an economic practice that, um, that relies on cold and snowy winters. And we can use TEK here for providing a baseline and changes that we're seeing in all of our cultures. So the example is winter logging, which requires a habitat, if you'll bear with me on that definition, of frozen roads. So what evidence are we seeing of change? Where we're we seeing lost days of logging due to thawed ground. And again, I use the same map, the same projection of warming temperatures in Wisconsin and warming winters, which is going to mean not only issues for poor little Waboos, but it's going to mean fewer colder nights for loggers, less frozen ground, affecting the harvest and transport of logs to market, which becomes a pocketbook issue. This is a way of making climate change come alive to, um, to folks that uh, rely on cold and snowy habitats uh, for winter economic activities. And you could substitute snowmobiling, downhill skiing, cross-country skiing, snowboarding in this scenario. This is the website that has extra resources for you if you'd like to investigate the GWAL curriculum a little bit more. Um, the easiest way to do it is to go to the website. It's www.gwal.org. It's g-wal.org. I think you'll be able to see the website at the bottom of the screen. I've got some other um, messages uh, 
have stuck in my view. Uh, but I think that you can see that. If not, I can provide that later. Uh, up at the top of the website on the tabs, resources, you'll see um, uh, uh, strategies for the GWAL model. And you can explore the website, which includes four seasonal Ojibwe life ways and how to integrate TEK and SEK in order to evaluate climate change and then apply it to your culture. Um, it's the four life ways here. There is also a unit on water and climate change, integration of SEK science, there is a section on creating climate change action projects, and then finally a talking circle where you can share climate action projects that you've developed. And there's a number of different resources here across the top that may be helpful. We also do, uh, with our GWAL project and our Climate Strong uh, Climate Literacy uh, Program, which is related to GWAL, and as Dr. Sartini said, we do quite a few uh, climate change and ecology professional development field courses, including with UW Stevens Point. Um, unfortunately, this year we were not able to do our September course, but when we do, we weave in TEK and SEK. And how we do this is by seeking guidance, first of all, from our tribal partners, such as Marvin Defoe, an elder and Redcliffe Historic Tribal Preservation Officer, who is sharing uh, his TEK perspectives here with uh, one of our Climate Strong Institutes uh, from 2019. We make sure that we start with culture, not in respect. We start with culture both in the GWA models when you go into the website, it starts with culture, but we always start with culture in respect to um, the indigenous people whose lands we are on and to uh, make sure that it is integrated with SEK appropriately. We integrate in ceremony, uh, again, taking guidance from our tribal communities. We make sure indigenous voices are heard and their perspectives are heard. And we build awareness and respect of treaty rights and tribal sovereignty into our curriculum and then support culturally relevant climate action. So oh, does this work? Okay, in terms of climate change and our experience with integrating culture and science, we have two sets of evaluation here that I wanna share with you. One comes from a 2015 GWAL Climate Institute. This is a formal and informal educators. And one comes from a 2019 Climate Strong Institute, which is based on the GWAL model, it just has a different title to the Institute. And as you can see here, there's been an increase in uh, literacy, confidence in teaching, ability to incorporate place-based evidence and, and, the, and the transferability of the model to different populations, not just indigenous, but to all cultures. All right, so that was one example. We've got a couple more, so bear with me. So I'm, this is another example of integrating uh, different knowledges. And we're gonna talk about doing this in terms of leadership development. And Dr. Sartini gave a little preview of this, of this leadership initiative that we call ReCharge with the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission. So the goal here was to integrate indigenous, Ojibwe indigenous leadership principles, language and culture to build a shared leadership um, model or shared leadership of the operation of the Biological Services Division, which is a division of about 26 scientists, um, wildlife scientists, biologists that uh, study off reservation treaty rights and impacts on fish and wildlife, et cetera. So these tend to be SEK uh, oriented folks, and some are indigenous and some are not. But they had been working on through kind of a top down leadership model and uh, wanted to move to a different way and a more culturally appropriate way of working together. So we developed some planning and evaluation tools to help them do this. So I'm just going to share a couple with you and so you can kind of get the idea of how these work. Um, one of the activities that we develop for them is to treat everyone like a leader activity. This is a fun icebreaker activity where we actually uh, give people Western, Western leadership, we don't call it Western, but leadership words that are from Western oriented um, research on leadership. Um, so each person is given a word, but they are not allowed to look at the word this Western leadership word that comes from research. And they are told to hold it up to their forehead. So you see two, two Glyphwick staff members there holding up words to their forehead. And in this fun activity, what we ask people first of all to do is to meet other people within the division and interact with them, but treat them according to the word that they have, the leadership word that they have on the top that on their forehead. So if they have a word such as authoritarian, which shows up in Western uh, leadership uh, perspectives, the person that's talking with them treats them as if they were authoritarian. And it's up for the to the person that has that word to try to guess what their leadership word is. This goes on for a while and it's lots of fun. But the real gist of it is when we 
meld the two ways of knowing about leadership together is when we have, after everybody has tried to guess their word and they look at it, we have them come inside and we have posted the Ojibwa seven leadership teachings that you see there on the left side of the screen. Honesty, truth, respect, love, and you can read them yourself. But what we have them do then is take their Western leadership words and place them on which of the seven teachings they think it relates to. Some words do relate to the seven teachings. Others, such as authoritarian, do not. And then we have a teachable moment where we can talk about how uh, Western and indigenous leadership um, strategies and perspectives work, and maybe some that are not as indigenous as others and may be put aside for working in a shared leadership model. Another tool that we use is the medicine wheel tool. This uh, tool is a planning and also an evaluation tool that can be used in a lot of different uh, circumstances. Uh, this was developed by my colleague, Dr. Annie Jones, who is a Menominee tribal member and a, a tribal liaison and professor of organizational development at UW Extension. And you can see some of the questions that uh, the medicine wheel poses. Um, it integrates traditional indigenous perspectives of the connection of self, spirit, heart, mind, and body. And the example that I am sharing with you here is Glyphwood staff using the medicine wheel tool to generate ideas for how they could integrate TEK into their very science-based work. And here's what Dr. Sartini was referring to. Arts and cultural skills activity carry important teachings and they are important to integrating TEK. So when we have leadership development programs and even when we do our climate strong leadership uh, institutes, we always integrate art and cultural practices. So here we see the Glyphwood Biological Services staff making wild rice knocking sticks and making a SEMA or tobacco pouches. And there are teachings that are carried here that are shared during the time of making these things. So again, does this work? Um, you can take a look at the goals from, we've had four recharge or retreats with this particular division. You can see some of their goals and you can see the outcomes to date that they have adopted a shared leadership model and it's a work in progress. They're integrating TEK into the reporting and daily operations. The team is taking Ojibwe Moan or Ojibwe language lessons now so that they can get more proficient at that. And they've also established what they have, are calling a teaching lodge. It's virtual right now, but it will be in a physical form after COVID where they're sharing and learning about Ojibwe skills on a bi-monthly basis. So here's another example. We're just about done. This is kind of a sneak preview that you guys are getting that uh, really is not out in the public yet. Um, the Apostle Islands National Lakeshore uh, near Bayfield um, has conducted a climate vulnerability assessment. Um, they, their goal with this uh, vulnerability assessment is to integrate Ojibwe TEK into the public outreach of this very Western science dominated assessment. And the challenge is now to make it virtual due to COVID. So TEK was to be integrated into this assessment. It was not done and it was not done in a good way. So this is a, a way that the Park Service is trying to outreach this and integrate this into people's understanding of how the park is being affected by climate change and what people can do to help. So this is a sneak preview of how we're proposing to weave these knowledges together in a virtual setting, in a website setting. Um, this will be an interactive map that can be clicked on a map of the Apostle Islands, also of Lake Superior and Sky World. And each uh, map data point will open up to a 360 panorama of each of the 11 ecosystems that are included in the vulnerability assessment. Um, the name will be in Ojibwe in English and where it is found in the Apostle Islands. But the key point here is in terms of integrating traditional ecological knowledge, how we're going to orientate the interpretation is not just integrating voices, Ojibwe voices, language, and art, but we're going to organize it according to the Ojibwe four levels of creation, physical world, plant world, animal world, human world, and an extra resource icon that are connected, the connectivity here between all of them. Um, this will be co-created in consultation with local TEK specialists who will share ownership of the website content. And so this is a sneak preview of how this is going to look. We've just started, to, this is just a design concept at this point, but we should have this ready to go um, and posted for use probably by springtime. And this assessment has brought up some interesting teachable moments. So often I'm asked, do TEK and SEK always agree? 
And we're finding through this vulnerability assessment, uh, not necessarily. So the example here is in this climate vulnerability assessment, a very Western-based um, evaluation of climate impacts on the Apostle Islands, one of the ecosystems, the marine erodible bluffs, is classified as being very low in vulnerability because the, the clay type or the clay red clay cliffs here are slough off very frequently and are very highly erodible and subject to erosion. So the beings that live there are adapted to climate change and to changing conditions. So it's considered low vulnerability to climate change, but not so according to traditional ecological knowledge. Guidance from Edith Leoso, Bad River Historic Preservation Officer and others say, oh no, this ecosystem is highly vulnerable to climate change because of the important beings that live there, beings that provide medicine and subsistence, but also the destruction of Ojibwa near water cultural and burial sites is occurring because of this erosion. So here's a teachable moment between the two ways of knowing whether how we weave them together and what they can teach us. We have one more initiative to share. This is another leadership initiative. Uh, we'll be decolonizing leadership programming by integrating indigenous perspectives and traditional concepts with Western Eurocentric leadership. This is a pilot program that we're developing, integrating Ojibwa and Menominee leadership for people of all cultures and informing UW leadership programs. So not top down, not UW informing uh, tribal leadership, but the other way, uh, bringing these perspectives up through UW system for, for our leadership programs with the vision of creating an indigenous leadership institute uh, within the Great Lakes area. So those are a few examples. Um, finally, I'd like to share with you some things that I've learned through my journey of uh, working in tribal communities here. And again, I have many things to learn and I offer these things with sincere humbleness. First of all, it's very important to remember respect, um, to consult with and respect uh, the guidance of cultural leaders, community leaders, tribal elders, etc. cetera. Um, understand what's expected when you're in a community. And if you don't know, ask if you're unsure. Ask in a good way, in a humble way, because you are the guest. And recognize that there have been historical violations of trust that's inhibited knowledge exchange and um, ability or a willingness to work with others from outside of the community. So this will take time to build this trust. When you're working with uh, projects such as, our, um, such as our Apostle Islands project, agree on the use and ownership of information that's going to be shared with you. And as I indicated, the information there is gonna be co-created and shared with our, um, the indigenous communities that are, uh, that are uh, providing it to us, but also they will be able to help us edit it and have ownership of it. And finally, hold respect for all beings, both human and non-human, tangible and intangible. Relationships are super important. <laughs> Recognize that this takes time. You need to dedicate the time to building understanding and trust with the communities and also the land, of spending time in the land and in the community. You need to listen, super important, taking guidance from the community, not trying to be the one that's inserting themselves to be the authority. Um, it's important to acknowledge that connectedness that we talked about before and to open both your mind and your heart to considering different perspectives than what you may have been taught in your culture or taught by SEK. This also carries responsibility to foster and maintain connections, to take care of all of your relatives, both human and non-human beings to take responsibility and acknowledge any missteps that you might make. And believe me, you will make them, and I have made plenty of them, and learn from them. Um, spending time in a tribal community and connecting on a personal level is a responsibility that's broader than just working on a particular project that you might be doing, and brings such richness in relationships. And again, committing to that long-term relationship to build trust and mutual support. And a super important one is reciprocity showing gratitude for the gifts of knowledge that you've been given, um, maybe through gifts given to knowledge holders. Um, it, it can be appropriate and certainly must be appropriate credit for knowledge that has been shared. But again, here guidance from the community should be, uh, should be your guide. Be guided by the seven teachings that I shared with you uh, in terms of your, um, how you work with tribal communities. And be ready to share and participate and help in return. And I think the, the best quote of all is from the Glyph of Tribal Adaptation Menu that has some excellent guidance on working with tribal communities. The effort that you dedicate will dictate what you see in return. And 
here is that resource if you'd like to um, uh, take a look at it. The uh, link is there on the screen. Um, this is not only a uh, guide for working with tribes in climate adaptation, but has excellent guiding principles in interacting with tribes. And the Ojibwe words there mean doing something based on the Anishinaabe way. So an excellent resource that I would highly recommend. So with that, I would say Chimi Gwich, thank you so much for the time that you spent with me and allowed me to share with you. At the bottom of the screen that I can't see because I've got a, a navigation bar in the way, uh, you can see my contact information, my email. Please feel free to email me if I can provide any help or connections for you. And I also have my FYI site if you're interested in all of the things that I do as an environmental outreach state specialist. In addition to some of that I've mentioned here, you can find them on that website. So Chimi Gwich, thank you so much. Thanks, Katha. I think that was really, uh, really pretty interesting. Um, I like I told I've told you this many times. I could listen to you tell this story just over and over. I feel like every time you tell it, there's something new for me to hear and something new for me to learn, which I really appreciate. Um, so I have a few questions for you, if you don't mind answering them. And if any of you guys have questions that you'd like to um, put in the chat, please feel free to just go ahead and put some of those in, and then we'll we'll see if Kat Cat can't uh, give us some answers here. Um, one thing that I've never asked you before, Kat, that I'd like to take this opportunity to ask now, is what what do you think that the, sorry, the dogs are not gonna let me do this. What do you think are the um, connections between your work with the tribes and with Glyphwood? And what advice do you think that maybe state agencies could use as well? I feel like you're, the work that you do is so culturally sensitive and you work so hard in order to do that. What kind of stories do you think that, that more Western um, state agencies might you know, find relevant? Mm. Well, I think, again, going back to the four, the, the respect, the relationships, reciprocity, responsibility, really hold the key. Um, oftentimes when um, we come into tribal communities, we being those who are not from the community, we come in with our own perspectives as being the right way or the only way. And this may be an add on to our knowledge or it might be a one and done type thing, or we're going to come and help inform and maybe add into our knowledge base versus recognizing the, the richness, the cultural rich, richness and knowledges that can help inform us. So we're not just top down, but also blending from, from community to, to the institutions that we might be serving. I think oftentimes we don't spend the time. Time is a huge piece of this, um, dedicating the time to build the trust and responsibilities and listening to people and what they say. And sometimes it, there are perspectives that, are, that may be uncomfortable, uh, may be uncomfortable to hear, again, as I mentioned, there has been violations of the trust historically, and you can sometimes get pushback um, if you're not from the community. And you have to kind of let that come out. That's part of the process of making those connections and building trust with people. And I think oftentimes many of our agencies don't have the time, are not willing to do that. But I think that's changing, actually. And I think that's a very, very good thing. Um, those are a few that I would mention, but again, I would go back to those two slides where I kind of outlined the things that I've learned. And again, everyone will make missteps, and that, that is the case where you need to be humble and be willing to be corrected um, and, and, and learn um, from another culture um, what is a good way to do something um, that, that maybe uh, is even better than what you had originally planned. Yeah, I was kind of struck by that. I think that it's hard. I think it's hard to tell a biologist not to walk into a room as an authority figure because that's how we think of ourselves as as the authority figure, and we think of ourselves as having the answers to things. And I think maybe the attitude that goes along with that might make it harder to listen. Maybe mm -hmm. and is that kind of how you feel about it? Yes, I think so too. And I think oftentimes we, we in our culture, you know, we're a competitive culture. We sometimes forget to acknowledge the people that have, that, that have helped us along the way and to be what I would call humble in that. And I think that those seven teachings, again, uh, the Ojibwe seven teachings are good guideposts. 
and I think they're things that are held across many cultures. Um, and that was actually one of the points of our uh, Treat Everyone Like a Leader to make that point, that Ojibwe cultural uh, leadership teachings have equal and, and, and value and validity in terms of other leadership perspectives. But yes, I think that we need to make sure that we uh, acknowledge where and be humble of where our knowledge has come from. That's one thing that I see in tribal communities that I often don't see, and even with tribal biologists and, and, and researchers, because they are just as based and grounded in SEK knowledge as anybody, and as competent as anyone. But the way it's approached is a little bit different for many of them. So yeah, kind of just how we approach each other. I think that's interesting. That's really interesting. Um, I have one more question for you. Actually, also, you said something about decolonizing. I didn't quite catch it because you were going a little fast through that part. Decolonizing our perspectives or decolonizing our approach. What do you mean by that? Well, we're so used to doing things in a Western perspective, just like we've been speaking of. We're the authority. Um, our knowledge is is dominant, so it, you know it will will have will bring it to your community, and we might add on what you have to say if we think it's relevant. You know, almost a very presumptuous. Not everybody, please don't get me wrong on that, but it, that has been a way in because of the the colonization and the pushing aside of other ways of knowing. So this is a way of decolonizing that, and it's kind of a buzzword now. So I hesitated to use it, but it is a way of bringing in other ways of knowing, of respecting those ways of knowing. And again, it gives us a much broader, just like weaving that braid together. A one strand of a braid isn't very strong, but three strands of a braid or multi strands of a braid are much stronger. And this is a way that, that we can weave together different knowledges. So that's what I intended with that particular little circle that I was trying to explain. Okay, good deal. So it's exactly kind of what I was thinking. I just didn't have a word for it. Awesome. Um, Chris, I see you've raised your hand. There, am I unmuted? I think I'm unmuted. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hi, Chris. So, hi. Um, loved your talk. I kind of dropped off for a bit when my internet failed. Um, just like students, internet fail for faculty too. Mm -hmm. um, I loved what you said about, um, I think it was the responsibility um, thing where you talked about spending time in a community to connect on a personal level, not just with a project. And I think that was um, really nice because sometimes we go in. I found this with um, indigenous people down in the Chaco of Paraguay too that Western um, universities would come in and want to start collecting blood for viral studies or whatever. And I lived there for three years, so I had some credibility when I wanted to go out and do projects. Um, but, but as someone that might want to work, um, it's like, how, how do you, you know, I just happen to live there for three years. I mean, if you don't live there all the time, how do you start building those relationships from like a distance? You do a lot of driving. Oh, you do do a lot of driving. Um, driving, okay. calling, um, you, it, it's up to you to make the effort. Um, and so I don't live that close. I live uh, probably 30 miles from the nearest tribal community. So I drive and I I make frequent stops and um, in developing those relationships on a project, let's say you're doing a project and you've, you're seeking guidance um, and um, uh, maybe partnership with a tribal community, what, what you'll find if you take the attitude that this is not a one and done type thing, you will develop relationships that will be long lasting for the rest of your life. Um, and, and it brings so much richness, not only to the project that you're working with, but also to yourself as a human being and to helping bridge um, cultural differences between all of us, uh, between our knowledges and between communities. And so you become part of that bridge, which is very important. And there are cultural teachings about that as well. Um, but it takes a lot of time and it, and it does take driving sometimes and effort. And everybody knows that people are busy. Tribal people are busy too. They don't always connect with each other. Eat, eat, you know, we're all kind of in the same boat here, but you do have to make that extra effort. And I, I, I know that you've done that in the work that you've, that you've been dealing with, Chris. And when you're in a far distance, when you're farther away, like you are probably now, you're probably keeping some kind of correspondence going with those people that you worked with um, because you probably made lifelong friendships through that project. 
Yeah, I think that that's such a hard part because I, I think we're so used to such a fast paced world where it's like, I'm not going to take the time to drive down there and talk to that person in person. And that's one thing that I really love about the work that you do, Kat, is how seriously you take the relationships that you have with people. Um, and um, I was actually curious just like how the pandemic, like, because you're not visiting people face to face now, all of a sudden you're in this world where you can't do what you normally do and you're having mm -hmm. to find other ways to make those connections. Um, just weird, right? Yeah, it is strange, but I, I have the relationships. I mean, I've been uh, fortunate enough to build those relationships over the years and everybody else in the tribal community is in the same boat. We're all on Zoom all day long. So we know each other, we built those relationships. So it's not as uh, difficult as if we hadn't built relationships. But for example, I'll give you an example. Um, in the communities here, it's often um, uh, uh, culturally appropriate if you're asking an elder or someone for knowledge that you present them with a SEMA, which is tobacco. And that is done in person. And it's really difficult. We have not found a way to give a SEMA virtually over Zoom. So when I ask for guidance from people that I cannot meet in person, they know me and I express this to them, my, my hope that they would um, help me with guidance and that I would um, look forward to the day that I could offer some ASEMA for the guidance give, given. Um, so that's an example of a cultural practice that is kind of within our communities here that's impossible to do with COVID. Um, uh, but again, the relationships that I've built, um, people of course understand that. And I'm sure between tribal members themselves um, that are just social distancing, they also probably have the same, you know, same understandings. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's super interesting. Um, we've got just one question that popped up in the chat just now. So if you don't mind, um, would you mind telling us what your favorite part of your job is? Hmm. Well, working with tribal communities is the, my favorite part of the job. And um, working with these knowledges and um, being able to have the privilege of um, having those shared with me. Uh, making friendships and relationships with uh, the people that I've worked with. Some of you, you saw some of them on the on the screen, and then uh, trying to serve as that bridge. Um, and I, I don't mean to be presumptuous in saying that, but trying to bridge those knowledges and and trying to make issues like climate change um, increasing awareness so that people take action because that's something that is affecting all of us in all of our cultures, um, and it's a critical issue that we need to address. But there are many others as well. Mm -hmm. Very good. I love how you just answered what is uh, what is your favorite part of your job with my job. <laughs> right, pretty much. Mm -hmm. um, so there's one more here. Are you personally familiar with multiple tribes or uh, and their cultures? So or is it mainly just in one area? Mm -hmm. um, I'm most familiar, obviously, with working within my immediate geography within a driving distance of a day. So I work primarily with Bad River and Red Cliff, which is our Ojibwa bands, uh, Lac de Flambeau, which is an Ojibwa band. So more Ojibwa in this area. I've worked a little bit less with uh, um, uh, Oneida and less with the Ho-Chunk, just simply because of distance and opportunity. I am aware of those cultures, but I am not as I don't have the connections as I do with the Ojibwa community here. Um, I also work with a number of national uh, and international indigenous groups on climate change issues, such as Rising Voices. So I, I should have mentioned this earlier. Here's a, here's a group of indigenous scientists and non-indigenous scientists that are interested uh, in doing research and application of TEK and SEK in terms of climate change, climate change awareness, and also adaptation and mitigation responses that are culturally relevant. Um, if you look up, if you find, go on the uh, net and look up uh, Rising Voices and put in climate change, and you'll find them. They are out of UCAR, um, out of Boulder, Colorado, uh, but they include indigenous scientists from around the world. Um, and they have an annual conference that is just excellent to go to, where you will hear from them directly on the research that they're doing and the perspectives that they're bringing from the tribal communities to inform our SEK science. Yeah, that answers cool. the question. Is there anything else we'd like to ask, Kat? I think. Yeah, let's I see. Have a question that kind of goes to cultural evolution. You mentioned about how traditional ecological knowledge, is, as we know it in North America, is, is largely qualitative. 
and uh, Western science, whatever you want to call it, is, is more quantitative. And Western science in Europe, you know, it developed in the 1500s, very quantitative with Bacon and Galileo and Newton and all the other physicists. But we didn't see that type of cultural evolution here in North America, and nor in Asia either. But I think of Asia, they have a tremendous amount of traditional ecological knowledge, but they really went hyper quantitative maybe in the last you know, 100 years. So I'm curious how, you know, what factors might have influenced these different evolutions in culture from say North America to Europe to, to Asia that develop these very different patterns in quantitative versus qualitative? Hmm. That's a really good question. I think that is a graduate project for one of these students. <laughs> <laughs> but just off the, off the cuff, I'm just thinking of, I'm going back to, again, the relationship with the definition of culture. Very human centric in our Western cultures. Um, some of that may be due to um, uh, religious perspectives, etc. cetera. Where in, in, and I'm kind of speaking from my own, this is just my own, um, my own take on it. Um, whereas very place-based, land-based, different ways of relating to the environment and beings in indigenous cultures, that to me may inform that um, the qualitative versus quantitative way of looking at things. It's mm -hmm. just a, a hypothesis. Well, one of the one of the students here may want to take that on. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Who will it be? Um, I just wanted to quickly note that we're we're officially past time, but um, if you have other questions, there's another one in the chat, uh, for example, we can answer a few more questions, but don't feel bad if you've got something else that you need to do. So um, I want to thank everybody for being here as well. Um, I really appreciate it. And Kat, I've really appreciated your time. Um, and actually, I'm curious about this one question, so I want to make sure that we get to it. Um, so Lily is asking, how do you create the relationships with tribes? Um, is it more like how you would build a friendship, or is it directly participating in the tribe's culture? It's both. It's really both. And um, it always, it helps if you have um, someone who can introduce you to tribal members or introduce you into the community. Um, if that's not the case, um, working with the historic tribal preservation officer, and you saw the, the picture of Marvin Defoe from Red Cliff and Edith Leosa from Bad River, that's an excellent um, first contact person to talk with and express interest if you'd like to start working with a tribal community. But it's building um, friendship, relationship, uh, mutual understanding, uh, reciprocity between what is shared with you and giving back to the person or community that's sharing that with you. But it's also participating and being in community. I can't stress that enough. Um, it's hard now with COVID, obviously, but spending time within the community, participating in community events, it may be um, some type of uh, fun thing that the community is doing. It might be a powwow in terms of like our communities here, um, but being, being there with people and, um, and showing that you are not isolated from them. You, you want to be with them. You want to share. You want to, you want to understand. Uh, and again, even if you take missteps in doing that, which I have, um, you'll be, you'll be, um, you'll be uh, instructed in the right way to do things. And then, um, you know, it, it, that's all part of the learning, let's put it that way. But you do need to be in community. And that, that is with any culture, isn't it? You need to be with people. Um, if you're going to build those relationships. Yeah, it's funny because I feel like I'm feeling that as well, like trying to learn about, and I'm thinking about work and work in um, more traditional venues or more traditional, my, my Western yeah. know, agency oriented mind. Yeah, I have another suggestion too. Um, some of you may know I, I'm also a pointer graduate, uh, both masters and undergrad. And um, when I was at Point, there was a Native American club uh, called Arrow. I don't know if it still exists. I think it does. Yeah. And this may be if you're interested in learning more about working with tribal communities and building relationships, that would be an excellent place to start. And maybe that's an, another way that your class, uh, maybe someone from Arrow or from the American Indian Studies program can speak with your class about these things. You're getting this from the perspective of a non-tribal member here who is working hard to build those relationships. And you may find other ways of understanding more about this by speaking with uh, a, tribal, a tribal person um, who can share different perspectives. 
but Arrow might be a way to get involved right on your campus with some of your peers and colleagues. You know, for several years, we've had a powwow right on campus as well in Berg Gym. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, this past April, we couldn't do it because of COVID, but uh, I'm sure they're looking at being able to hold another one again. Mm -hmm. And everyone is welcome. Yes, everyone is welcome. And they're great fun to do. They're always <laughs> are wonderful. Great places to meet people and, and, and interact. Yeah, I think the, the important part is just going, right? Mm -hmm. I think sometimes it's like so easy to feel awkward when you're taking steps into something that you're not used to. But if you don't take the step, you're not going to get the benefit. You know, right. so if you go in, in an open and honest way, I think that's the best, the best approach. Yes. yes, it is. And people will be able to see that if you come this way, if you come with an open, an open mind and open heart. People can see yeah. that. We can we all recognize that in others, don't we? And that will happen the same within a tribal community. What is that saying, that Chinese saying, a journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step, but it will be up to us to make that step if we want to build these relationships. Yeah. Very good. Thank you so much, Kat. I really appreciate it. Um, and thanks to you all. So I hope you all have a lovely evening. Kat says that she's up in the Northwoods. She's got some leaves that she needs to go be looking at. Mm -hmm. um, but if you want to stick around a little bit longer, introduce yourself to Kat, you're welcome to do that. Um, otherwise, I will see you all at our next Living with Wildlife seminar in a couple weeks. Actually, I'll see most of you uh, very much sooner than that, like next week. Um, but the rest of you in about four weeks will be having another one. So we'll see you then. Iguabana Ninawa, which means see you around. But I'll stay if anybody has any extra questions. <laughs>